Charleston, April 24, 1780. When the second parallel pressed forward on our right wing, the enemy withdrew, leaving 20 muskets behind. But they covered their retreat with so excessive a shower of canisters, which were loaded with old burst shells, broken shovels, pickaxes, hatchets, flat irons, pistol barrels, broken locks, etc., and so enfiladed us at the same time from the front redoubt of their left wing that one could hardly hear another close beside him. The Diary of Captain Johann Hinrichs of the Hessian Jaeger Corps. Such was the scene at the British siege of Charleston, South Carolina, as Americans within the city, desperate and growing more desperate by the day, sent anything and everything that might tear into flesh over the British trenches. Thus, men were blown apart, limbs torn off or shattered, often in the dark of night, when a man's fear was only limited by his imagination. For a month and a half in the spring of 1780, the British lay in siege around the crown jewel of the American South, as horror, both inside and outside the city, increased by the day. It's terror in South Carolina, Charleston, and Camden, on this episode of Bigfoot's Great American History Show. In the spring of 1778, with the entrance of France into the American Revolution, the British placed their hopes in a new strategy for victory. The rebellion, thought many in the king's ministry, was the brainchild of but a few bad eggs in a Costco-sized carton, which otherwise still loved its king and his parliament. And nowhere was this truer, they believed, than in the American South. Give the silent majority something to rally around, and the rebellion of the few might still be quashed. <laughs> So it was that in November of 1778, having abandoned operations in Philadelphia, the British sent a force of 3,500 men to capture the town of Savannah, Georgia. The much smaller American force defending the town was routed in the ensuing battle. Now with a foothold in the south, the British proceeded to do nothing. Like for all of 1779. British ministers and generals were evidently too busy defending their honor back home as newspapers railed against them for the catastrophic defeat at Saratoga and the consequent departure from Philadelphia. Indeed, the desire to continue on with the war, now in its fifth year, seemed to be hanging by a thread. By the end of the year, General Henry Clinton, now in command of the British land forces in America, had found the impetus to march on Charleston, then the largest and really the only city in the South. On March 29, 1780, Clinton and his men crossed the Ashley River at Drayton Hall, only 12 miles above Charleston. A mere two days later, the British force was within 800 yards of the American defenses north of the city. The British promptly began to dig a parallel, or a series of trenches and redoubts parallel to the American lines. In this, the siege proceeded more or less according to 18th century convention, as sappers dug inexorably toward the city primarily at night, and more and more as they neared the American defenses, under heavy artillery and rifle fire. Meanwhile, the British returned covering fire through embrasures cut into hulking 10-foot-high mantelets, reinforced by 12-foot-thick earthen walls. By the time a second parallel was complete, the two sides were near enough to each other that they could see the blood their weapons shed with the naked eye. Indeed, terror-stricken soldiers in both camps began to desert to the other. Yet for Benjamin Lincoln, the commander of the American troops inside the city, defeat appeared inevitable. Every night the British sappers dug, and every morning when the sun rose, they were a little closer to the American defenses. By late April, a third parallel was complete. Still, the civilian leadership of Charleston refused to surrender, despite Lincoln's pessimistic assessment of their chances of victory. Some, it seemed, expected General Washington to come to the rescue. Alas, no such rescue was in the making. On May 12th, Lincoln finally agreed to terms, resulting in the capture of some 2,500 Continental soldiers, 343 artillery pieces, and 6,000 muskets. And, uh, of course, uh, large stores of uh, Rome. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> Following the capture of Charleston, Clinton turned over command of the Southern Campaign to General Charles Cornwallis and returned to New York. Meanwhile, the Americans replaced Lincoln with none other than General Horatio Gates, 
the hero of Saratoga, a man bursting with confidence, who in earlier days had conspired to take George Washington's job. Three months after the fall of Charleston, Gates approached Camden, South Carolina, intent on liberating the state. Alas, in so doing, he both overestimated his own numbers and remained blissfully unaware that Cornwallis had recently joined the troops in Camden under Lord Rawdon. Even so, he greatly outnumbered Cornwallis, and had he been a more effective field commander, might have won an important victory for the Americans. As it was, the two sides met on August 16th, on opposite sides of an open field about 250 yards long. As was convention, both generals placed lesser trained militia on the left and more experienced regulars in a place of honor on the right. So it was that on both sides of the battlefield, regulars faced off against opposing militia. This would prove crucial once the fight began. Confronted by a British bayonet charge, the inexperienced American militia panicked and fled, opening up the left flank of the right side of their line, which had been holding its own against Rodin's loyalist militia. Now outflanked, the American regulars on the right also collapsed. Gates did not stick around to organize the retreat. In fact, by August 19th, a mere three days after the battle, he had fled all the way to Hillsborough, North Carolina. A distance of 180 miles. In the end, 1,000 Americans were captured and 900 more were killed or wounded. Needless to say, Congress removed Gates from command. He was replaced, at last, by Washington's own choice, the Quartermaster General Nathaniel Green. As for the British, it was now evident that South Carolina, whatever it might once have been, was no longer a hotbed of loyalist sentiment. The British had captured Charleston and routed the enemy at Camden, yet far from arousing overwhelming local support for the king, local partisans like Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, went on raiding British supply lines and making surprise attacks against loyalist garrisons. In the end, while the British had effectively conquered South Carolina, their endgame remained as foggy as ever. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel if you enjoy our content. For now, this is Bigfoot saying so long and save me a seat at your next campfire.